It is my pleasure tonight to introduce Greg Haugen. And for all of you who have lived in, in and around Stoughton, Haugen is not a foreign name. There have been many, many Haugens. And we became very close to the Haugen family, and, but did not know Greg. D Greg's mother worked at the hospital for years and years, and his grandpa was our master painter as I was growing up. He came from Norway, and it's probably the first time that I ever heard anybody with a really deep road, and he really talked, and it was kind of fun. And I've talked to Greg about this. He always came, and he was always cheerful, and he always came with a white um, bib wall for on, and he had a white shirt. He looked very professional. And the best thing about Olaf Haugen was that he really knew how to mix paints. My mother's kitchen was yellow most of the time, but when she wanted a change, then she'd say, a little more yellow, a little more white, and he must have had spots all over. But it was fun, and he, I have to tell you that we first got our, my sister and I first got our jewelry. He brought home a little tiny solia, a very small one, when he had gone back to Norway. We didn't know what any of this was. And then I met Greg. Greg is a native of Stoughton who has been fascinated with the Civil, American Civil War since first studying the war in fifth grade at Kiganza Elementary School. Greg has visited relevant battlefields and museums in at least 12 states. He has made a life's history of understanding the historical impact of the war. He left Wisconsin in 1983 when he joined the U.S. Navy after 28 years of active duty and six years of, as a civilian with the Department of Defense, he retired and returned home to Stoughton. And when he came home, he had a bride with him, and her name was Karen. And I don't think she had been to the Midwest a lot of times until she met Greg. But we are happy to have Karen. She's been a marvelous friend and a wife, too. And he has four sons and most of them are not home anymore. Um, and I've told you as you came in tonight that the refreshments are based on cookbooks from the Civil War. And they've tried to make cookies and apples of some sort. And we also had cheese and um, crackers. I asked Patty, and she donated that, what her rolling pin was like for the crackers. And she couldn't tell me. And we know that they didn't eat bark off the tree all the time. <laughs> and with that, please welcome Greg Culler. And he did speak with a heavy Scandinavian accent. And I have one story I'll share. Um, when I was younger, he was telling me about my dad's service in World War II. And with his deep Norwegian brogue, it was, Junior yumped in the yeep. <laughs> I've never forgotten that. Um, anyhow, as Ann said, I've been interested in the Civil War a long time. I've dragged Karen and Alex to more battlefields than they can count to look at more hills, woods, and trees, and fields than they are wondering why are we looking at yet another woods and field. But um, on, on the picture you're seeing right now, uh, this is uh, Gettysburg, for those of you who've been there, um, from Little Round Town. And you're looking out both the Confederate and the uh, Union line here. Uh, to work. Where you see all the statues here, that's pretty much the Union line of battle. And over in the woods here is the Confederate line on Seminary Ridge, if you're familiar with that. And on the third day of the battle, Pickett charged across these fields, past this barn to the Union line. So this copse of trees right here was his target. So that's where the famous Pickett's charge occurred. Anyhow, that is, um, that is get a, a great shot at Gettysburg. Um, but before we go any farther, there's a game Karen and the boys and I like to play at home. 
and it's a Civil War game called What Happened on This Date? <laughs> well, I'm going to quiz all of you today. So May 10th actually had two Civil War, significant Civil War occurrences, uh, one in 1863, one in 1865. So does anybody know what very famous things happened on May 10th, 1863, and May 10th, 1865? Yes, Jordan, right? Uh, on May 10th, 1865, I'm pretty sure uh, when General Grant needed General Grant Good guess, but not quite. <laughs> On May 10th, 1865, and there actually may have been a Stoughton soldier involved in this, the 4th Michigan Cavalry and the 1st Wisconsin Cavalry captured Jefferson Davis in Abbeville, Georgia, as he was trying to flee the country. Uh, the other event, May 160 years ago today, uh, oh, in the back. Was he uh, disguised when they captured him? Um, that is a rumor. He, he did have a cloak over him and he got accused of wearing a dress. Um, 160 years ago today, uh, Stonewall Jackson died after being wounded accidentally by his own men at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And so with that, um, we'll go on. I, every winter, I like to have a project. So my winter project this year was doing research into Stoughton's involvement in the Civil War. And I spent a lot of time dealing with the online historical databases Wisconsin Historical Society provides and digging through that, that. And it's not a database in the modern sense of the database. What it is is really scanned pictures of pages of a document put together in the 1880s that documented all 91,000 plus Wisconsin soldiers who participated in the Civil War. And so I, I dug through that to create my own smaller database of all the Stoughton soldiers. So that's partly what I want to share with you tonight and some of their experiences. And as you can see in the picture here, that's actually two brothers from the Stoughton area, uh, the Goodmanson brothers, Dunkirk. Unfortunately, one of them did not survive the war and was um, died of disease. But the, that, I came across that picture sort of accidentally, but um, and it's one of the few of um, soldiers from the Stoughton area. So here, before we go any farther, I thought it'd be interesting to have a little bit of a picture of what was this area like back then compared to today. And you can see from the census data there are about 5,000 people living in the Stoughton area. And by that, I mean the Stoughton itself and the four surrounding townships. And with a population of about 5,000, 80 years later, just for comparison purposes, just prior to World War II, that had grown to almost 9,000. And if you'll notice, in 1860, Stoughton has no population because Stoughton wasn't a city yet. So, they only did the census by township until Stoughton became a city. So some of those township numbers in the 60s, 1860s include Stoughton residents. And the data I have, I found a, a census estimate in 1868 estimated Stoughton had about 950 residents at that time. Um, jumping forward to today, we're, you know, we've grown a lot. But what I found to be even more interesting is the national data. There were about 31 million Americans in 1860. That grew by almost 100 million by 1940. And between 1940 and 2020, we grew by 200 million people, which to me is just mind boggling. And so when they talk about the baby boom after World War II, they really aren't kidding, are they? That's pretty amazing. And as you'll see under the war debt, the Civil War did hit the Stoughton area hard. Far more deaths occurred during the Civil War than World War II. And as difficult as I know, World War II had to been on families around here. Can you only imagine what it was on a smaller population to lose that many young men? So here's the, the data on the actual numbers. 
I found 459 Stoughton area soldiers in the database. That's almost 10% of the population went to war. And um, as you'll see, almost a third of them came casualty, either killed in action, died of disease, or were wounded. And before we go any farther, I think it's important for everybody to understand how um, the armies were organized back in the Civil War, because that's how soldiers talked about them themselves. It determined where in the war they ended up going and that sort of thing. The fundamental building block was a regiment. And the regiments were actually political organizations in the sense that they were formed by each state. And the governor would appoint the colonel who headed the regiment and his deputies, the lieutenant colonel and the major. So it was a political appointment in reality. And then the, the regiments were formed of eight to 10 companies, usually 10 companies. And each company would have 80 to 100 men. Um, that company, then the regiments, well, I should also say, um, the, there was a chronological order. The first regiment organized in Wisconsin was the first Wisconsin infantry. The second was the second. And during the war, Wisconsin sent 53 uh, infantry regiments to the war and five cavalry regiments and a number of artillery batteries, totaling over 91,000 men. And uh, the regiment being the fundamental building blocks would be grouped together in what was called a brigade, uh, usually under the direction of a one-star general known as a brigadier general, although in the Union Army it was not uncommon for a colonel to head a brigade. And there would be anywhere from three to five regiments usually in a brigade. Brigade was the fundamental unit of action in a battle. They would usually direct a brigade here or there uh, but not, not a regiment. The brigade was a very fundamental kind of building block in battle. And then brigades got grouped together to be a division, and they're usually under a two-star major general. And here's where there was a big difference between the Union Army and the Confederate Army. Um, in the Union Army, a division usually had two or three brigades, whereas in the Confederate Army, it would be three to five. So a Confederate division was a much more powerful unit than a Union division. And then finally, the uh, divisions would be grouped together in what was called a corps. Corps came around after about the first year, year and a half of war, when it, it really became recognized that on the battlefield it was too unwieldy to have a dozen or more divisions under the control of one officer, because command and control was very difficult in those days. It was line of sight and um, it, one, one general could not control 10, 15 divisions in a battle very well. So they grouped them together in corps, and that would be usually two to four divisions in a corps. And then the army. Mostly armies felt were, were geographically located. The Army of the Potomac fell along the Potomac River in the area of Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia, the Army of Tennessee along the Tennessee River, etc. On rare occasion, there would there'd be multiple armies involved in a single campaign, like when General Sherman um, went on the Atlanta campaign to capture Atlanta. He had three armies under him. In the last week or so of the war, when um, the Union Army was chasing General Lee toward Appomattox Courthouse, he had three, uh, General Grant had three armies under him. The Army of the Potomac with General Meade, the Army of the James under General Ord, and the Army of the Shenandoah under General Sheridan. And all three were heavily involved in, in it bringing the war to an end. So this may be the most surprising slide to me in all the research. I did. This is the number of soldiers in each of the regiments that Stoughton men participated in. I expected to find three or four or five regiments that had Stoughton men, but you look and, I don't know, there's 20 plus, 30 or 30 regiments that had Stoughton soldiers in it. Uh, of particular interest, 
You notice the 7th Wisconsin had 74. That was the most in any one regiment, was 74 men from Stoughton area or in the 7th Wisconsin. Um, in fact, there were enough men there, they named the company they were in, Company D, was known as the Stoughton Light Guard. And that's the name they held during the war. The next most numerous regiment was the 23rd Wisconsin, which really surprised me. Um, I expected to find it to be the 15th Wisconsin, which many of us are familiar with, and Colonel Haig, who headed the 15th, the All Scandinavian Regiment, but that only had 20 some soldiers. Where are we? Uh, 24 soldiers from the Stoughton area. I was surprised that that number was so, so, so low. But then I thought about it, you have to recognize um, that was pretty early in the Norwegian immigration when the Civil, Civil War occurred. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about the 15th in a few minutes. So where did they fight? Stoughton soldiers fought essentially all the major battles of the war, the ones we've all heard about, Bull Run, and Gettysburg, Antietam. Um, they were there, and they fought, and they died there. Uh, but the one, again, I think surprising number is a battle called Bronner's Farm, or the Battle of Gainesville, which is a battle most people have never heard of. Yet that's where Stoughton took more casualties by a significant amount than any other battle. Five soldiers died there and 11 were wounded. So we'll talk about that a little in a few minutes. And here's just some examples of, of what happened to some of these soldiers during the war. Um, the, the smaller the number, the earlier the soldiers went into the, into the war, like the 7th Wisconsin, the more casualties they had, which I guess makes sense. Um, 58% of the 74 soldiers of the 7th Wisconsin became a casualty. And of half of those in the uh, 15th Wisconsin became a casualty. And if you look at the end here, the 44 to the 453rd regiments, which weren't formed until late in the war, late 1864, early 1865, they had virtually no casualties and they didn't fight any battles. Um, the one, the, the regiments that were a little surprising, the 36th, the 37th, the 38th Wisconsin regiments weren't formed until the uh, winter, or early winter, I should say early spring of 1864. And they took heavy casualties because they were thrust into what's known as the Overland Campaign, where General Grant went against General Lee for the very first time. And in a six week period of that campaign, um, the Union Army took 55,000 casualties. And so they were creating new regiments to throw into the fight. So tonight, I'd like to talk a little bit about the 15th Wisconsin, a bit about the 23rd, because as I said, they had 63 Stoughton area men in that, and it's not, they fought in battles that many of us are not so familiar with. I want to talk about the 7th. Uh, the seventh is one of the most part of one of the most famous fighting units in the U.S. history, and there's another statistic that I just recently found that I thought was very telling. During the Civil War, the Union uh, created over 2,200 regiments across all the northern states. 2,200 regiments of cavalry and infantry. The seventh Wisconsin ranked through number three in the number of soldiers killed in battle. Out of 2,200 regiments, they ranked number three. They went through the thick of the war. And briefly, I want to talk about the 11th Wisconsin. But now time for a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> the American Battlefield Trust is an organization I belong to for over 30 years, and they really only have two purposes. One is to educate us about the Civil War, and they have great online program as well as a lot of YouTube videos that are free to look at. And the other is to preserve battlefields, because 
about 30 years ago, late 1980s, a group of historians recognized that battlefields were be turned into su suburbia. And they were particularly upset about a mall built in Fairfax, Virginia, that was built right on top of a battlefield, the battlefield of Chantilly. Now, it's not a real famous battle because only hundreds of soldiers died there, not thousands. But two Union generals were killed there. And um, when the mall was being built, they built a mall on top of this battlefield, the Fair Oaks Mall. Um, they dug up the remains of two soldiers who died in that battle. And that really upset these folks. So they created this organization to uh, preserve battlefields. Now, they originally were the Civil War Trust. They've expanded now. They will also preserve Revolutionary War and War of 1812 battlefields. And they have protected over 55,000 acres. They have taken large companies to court, like Walmart, who wanted to build a Walmart, a super center, on top of a battlefield. And they won the battle. The uh, American Battlefield Trust won that court battle, fortunately, and preserved that land. Um, so anyhow, it's commercial. If you have a few extra dollars, a little extra time, give them a look. <laughs> The 15th Wisconsin is the one probably most of us here are most familiar with. It's the All Scandinavian Regiment, headed by Colonel Hagg. Um, over 90% of the soldiers in that were Norwegian. There were a handful of Swedes and Finns and Danish soldiers, but it was primarily uh, Norwegian. And given the, the status or the relatively low immigra immigration at that time, it recruited soldiers from not only Wisconsin, but Illinois, Iowa, and Minnesota. And Colonel Hagg, as we've you know, heard quite a bit about, did a great job. He was recognized as a strong battlefield leader. And after the Battle of Stone River, he was promoted to brigade command. So now he was in command of four regiments, not just the 15th. And when that happened, a local stout knight uh, Ollie Johnson was promoted to command of the 15th Regiment. And he has a very interesting story that I'd like to share. Battle of Chickamauga, which I think most of us have heard of, was the second bloodiest battle of the war. It was also a rare circumstance when the Confederate Army actually outnumbered the Union Army. And I know this map's a little bit difficult to see, but from top to bottom, that's about 60 miles. And the general head of the Union Army, General Rosecrans, had a brilliant campaign, and he forced the Confederates to retreat out of the city of Chattanooga, which was a major supply and communication center for the Confederacy. Without a battle, he forced them out. And the Confederate Army started retreating south. And Rosecrans wanted to go after him and destroy it. But unbeknownst to him, because this is very mountainous territory, easy to hide in, uh, <coughs> the Confederates didn't go far south as he thought. They stopped, concentrated, and wanted to cut off a portion of this very spread out army and defeat a portion of it before taking on the rest of the army. And at the kind of at the last minute, General Rosecrans realized what was going on and started pushing his soldiers back up toward Chattanooga so that they wouldn't be cut off. And also unbeknownst to the Union, um, General Lee sent General Longstreet's entire corps to reinforce the Confederate Army. So that's why they would outnumber the Union in this battle. Now, we've heard of Colonel Quay, and we know he was wounded mortally at um, Chickamauga. And this is a beautiful battlefield that you know have been there, been there. It's very well maintained and very well marked. And this is the marker of the site where Colonel Haig was mortally wounded. This is the field of battle where he fought. And right now, it's where the cameraman where I stood to take the picture is where the Confederate soldiers were marching toward the trees 
in the fight, and the Union soldiers were along that tree line pretty much, or actually where those cannons were. And the battle flowed back and forth over this field for several hours, as one side got reinforced and then the other side got reinforced. And late in the afternoon, the Union forces under General Haig were routed. They, they just started to run because they were very much outnumbered. And while he was trying to restore order, this is the tip of his marker. If you can see right there, that's where that marker in the previous slide is. And that's where he was mortally wounded. Uh, the, battle was, the battle line stabilized shortly after that when Union reinforcements came. And that's sort of where the fighting stopped, was about <coughs> this position for the evening until the next day. During the evening, the Union Army continued to push northward toward Chattanooga. And the next day, probably about a mile north of this field, is where the 15th Wisconsin was when the battle reopened. If you had, were a Union soldier and you wanted to list the top 10 places that you didn't want to be during the war, this would probably be in the top five. Um, there was a screw up by the Union leadership during the battle that in the middle of the battle, they actually withdrew the division that was holding the very center of the Union line, leaving a gap. So they rushed in the division that included Colonel Hagg's brigade, which had been hit hard the day before in the fighting, was very much reduced in strength to fill this gap. Coincidentally, and it was coincidence, General Longstreet, the Confederate general, launched a massive attack at that very spot with about 10,000 men, hit a very weakened Union division, and he completely routed the Union army, except for the the left flank of the Union Army did hold, but the rest of the Army, they just ran for their lives. As you can see, this is a map of that location where that, that breakthrough by the Confederates occurred. There's a lot more red Confederate units than there are blue Union Division. They were completely overwhelmed, and much of the 15th Wisconsin was captured. Uh, and that's where the story gets interesting, I think. Our Colonel Ole Johnson from Stoughton was captured and sent to Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia, where it was a prison that most Union officers were sent to. Um, and while he was there, for several months, he actually wrote letters to his brother that still exists to this day, mostly talking about the conditions there, his need for food, and that sort of thing. Um, but then, in May of 1864, he was sent south, and he feared he was being sent to Andersonville, that very infamous prison, um, already had a horrible reputation. And so he and two other Union officers managed to escape while he was being sent south, were on the run for 29 days until they made it to Union lines in eastern Tennessee. So he survived the war, he survived prison, he came back after a, a short leave um, to command the 15th again and, and led it for the rest of the war. Uh, well, I'll finish the story about Ole. Ole Johnson came back to this area after the war and got married and eventually settled in Beloit and was elected mayor of Beloit. And he and his wife had a, had a son, and his son's middle name was Chickamauga. <laughs> he was such a really fascinating. So he didn't want to forget that experience, clearly. So Andersonville, I'm sure many of you have heard about Andersonville, that horrible, horrible place um, where thousands of Union soldiers perished. Um, the, up until about mid-1863, the North and South would exchange prisoners, so they didn't languish in prison camps for long periods of time. They were exchanged. But that came to a stop when the South tried to, started mistreating um, black soldiers, African-American soldiers, 
and sending them into slavery. And the North objected to that greatly and stopped the exchange program. And so it never really got back to a real good exchange to the very end of the war. Uh, and so Andersonville, unfortunately for those Union soldiers there, and this is a real picture of the real camp, um, conditions were awful. They didn't have enough food, they didn't have clean water. Um, at the same time, though, you must recognize many of the Confederate soldiers were also going very hungry because the supply chain in the South was breaking down by this point. So there was not enough food for the, the South's own soldiers, let alone prisoners. Uh, and two Stoughton soldiers died in Andersonville. And that is a modern picture of the camp, of the, what's left of Andersonville. Uh, and there's a national cemetery there with thousands and thousands of grave sites. So now I want to talk briefly about the 23rd Regiment. And remember, there were 63 still residents in the 6th, 23rd. Um, they fought in a very different part of the um, war. They fought along the Mississippi largely. And uh, it was a Grant, who headed the army, was under a lot of pressure to capture Vicksburg, Mississippi, because that was the one spot that the South controlled that can prevented traffic up going up and down the Mississippi River. And until Vicksburg fell, uh, he couldn't move supplies from the northern part of the Mississippi down to New Orleans or into the Gulf. So he, Grant was under a lot of pressure to capture Vicksburg. And his first attempts did not go well. In fact, during the winter of 1862, 1863, I'll get to that in a moment. So they had an area just north um, west of, of Vicksburg called Milliken's Bend. That was a supply depot and a hospital site um, prior to the Vicksburg campaign. And it was there that literally hundreds of Union soldiers died of disease. Apparently the water was just awful. And um, 20 soldiers from the Stoughton area died of disease there prior to the Vicksburg campaign starting. And there was actually a battle there um, after the Union had moved their supply depot. The, the South still thought it was there and attacked it. And uh, it was one of the first time in this battle that what were considered colored soldiers, the black soldiers, fought and defended this, this hospital site. And it really proved to the northern leadership that, that black soldiers were very capable at soldiers and willing to put their life on the line. And it gave them a great deal of credibility. So this is another one of the maps. It's hard to see, I understand. But this is the Mississippi winding its way down through Mississippi, and here is Vicksburg right here in this bend in the river. And Grant, and probably it's considered one of the most brilliant campaigns of the war, moved his soldiers down the other side of the river in Arkansas, down here, crossed the Mississippi below Vicksburg and went on a campaign and fought battles along the way. The biggest battle was a place called Champion Hill where he, the Union won and forced the Southern soldiers back into their defensive works around Vicksburg. And Grant attacked those lines on May 20th and 22nd. And during those attacks, a couple of Stoughton soldiers died and were not able to penetrate the works. And that's when the siege of Vicksburg began. And we may, you may have heard stories about civilians digging caves in the bluffs along the Mississippi, living in caves. Um, and that is what they did for several weeks until starvation forced them to surrender on July 4th, 1863. So now to the 7th Wisconsin. And I feel like I ought to spend a little time here because this group of soldiers were involved in so many of the famous or infamous sites of the Civil War and they sacrificed a great deal. Uh, they belonged to one of the most famous units of the war, known as the Iron Brigade, because of their fighting ability. 
and they, as you see, they wore a very distinctive uniform, especially the black hat. So they became known after the first couple battles to the southern troops as those damn black hatters, <laughs> because they, they were tough. They really were. So the Battle of Bronner's Farm is the one I mentioned earlier. Here, more Stoughton soldiers fell than in any other battle in the war. It was also their very first battle. And it occurred in late August of 1862. The Union General, General Pope, was trying to concentrate his army. And they were marching along and got drawn into battle here. And at the time, uh, the weapons they carried, the musket rifle, had an accurate range of up to 500 yards. But if you'll see in this picture where the sign is, this is the 2nd Wisconsin Infantry and where they stood. And up here is Alex, son Alex. That's where the Confederates were, about 50 to 75 yards away. So for two hours, they stood 50 to 75 yard, uh, yards apart and shot at each other. And needless to say, it didn't go well for anybody. Uh, and unbeknownst to them, they were greatly outnumbered. This is the view looking toward the road they were marching on. Way down here, this is the road they were marching on from west to east. When they looked up toward the farmhouse and they see a lone soldier on a horse. Well, it turned out that lone soldier was Stonewall Jackson. And he called artillery into action, who started shelling the soldiers as they were marching along. The Union general who commanded the Iron Brigade said, I'm not going to let a, what he thought was cavalry shell his soldiers. So he sent a couple regiments up to brush them away. He didn't run into cavalry. He ran into what was known as the Stonewall Brigade, the most famous fighting unit in the Southern Army. And not only the Stonewall Brigade, there was 20,000 other Confederate soldiers in a, in a railroad cut lined up over a two-mile range. Well, he drew more and more of the 7th Wisconsin, or the um, Iron Brigade into action, as well as a couple other regiments from another brigade. And they just shot each other from, like I said, 50 to 75 yards for two hours until it got too dark to see anything. And then at that point, General Gibbons recognized they were outnumbered and withdrew. And the very next day of the battle, a second bull run began. That's a picture of the farmhouse that's been beautifully restored by the National Park Service. And that's the name of the men that fell there from Stoughton. So a couple weeks later, after that horrific flight, um, the Iron Brigade fought at a place called South Mountain, and then on to Antietam three days later, which we may all know was the bloodiest day of, in American history, not just the bloodiest day in the war, the bloodiest day in American history. And this is just part of what's known as Bloody Lane, which happens to be a spot that Karen and the boys and I love to go picnic, because it is absolutely beautiful today. It is a beautiful, quiet spot. This is the farm that at dawn on the day of that battle, the Union, the uh, 7th Wisconsin marched through into battle. And they came to this cornfield. And it, as, as I said here, before the battle started, it was a cornfield, 24 acre cornfield on the Miller farm. And forevermore, it's known as the cornfield because 25,000 men battled there for four hours. 8,000 of them fell, either dead or wounded. And they said after the battle, you could walk over the field without ever touching the ground. It was horrific. That's in the top probably five places a Union soldier didn't want to be during the war. And yet, 7th Wisconsin was there and all these Stoughton boys. Then on to Gettysburg. Um, Antietam was in late uh, September of 1862. They didn't go to battle again until May of 1863 at Chancellorsville. 
But the Iron Brigade in 7th Wisconsin didn't, didn't really play a part in that battle. But then in early July 1st, 1863, as you'll see by the title, the final march of the Iron Brigade was an event Alex and I attended 10 years ago on the 150th anniversary of the battle. And we marched with the reenactors over the actual ground that the Iron Brigade marched into battle at the same time of day. So that was really a fascinating thing to do. Uh, it's called the last march. I'll tell you in a minute why it's the last march. Uh, but again, a couple of Stoughton soldiers fell here at Gettysburg. And this is a picture of what's known as the Herbst Woodlot, where the uh, 7th Wisconsin went into action on the first day of the battle. Gettysburg was a three-day battle, uh, intense fighting in all three days. Uh, when they went into battle, they were the first brigade in the first division of the first corps. And they were very, very proud of that distinction. They, they felt they were the best. They knew they were the best. And they were the second brigade to actually go into action at Gettysburg. And initially, they routed the Confederate infantry that they were facing. They captured the general that was commanding that brigade, along with a couple hundred soldiers. So initially, when they went into battle, on the 1st of July, they did well. Later that afternoon, they were overwhelmed. The Confederates came in overwhelming numbers and pushed back the Union troops through the streets of Gettysburg onto what was now today a Cemetery Hill. But during the course of that afternoon, the Iron Brigade went into the first day at Gettysburg with over 1,800 men. They mustered 600 the next day. And they were never really the same after that. In fact, the entire corps was um, never existed really after Gettysburg was over. It never, they moved the Iron Brigade into another corps for the rest of the war, and they added New York regiments to augment its strength. But it had lost that distinction. In fact, I have a print of a painting at home showing the 2nd and 7th Wisconsin going into battle in, that, in those woods. And the name of the painting is Final Glory. So that gives you an indication of how, what happened at Gettysburg to our 7th Wisconsin. So now, after Gettysburg, the Army of Potomac and the 7th Wisconsin really didn't do much until next following May, May of 1864. And General Grant was now the overall commander of the Union armies. He was the only three-star general in the North. And he decided to make his headquarters with the Army of the Potomac, which was still commanded by George Meade. And this is what was, became known as the Overland Campaign. Between early May and mid-June of 1864 was a series of horrific battles, starting at the Wilderness to Spotsylvania, to North Anna, to Cold Harbor, and then finally they moved down across the very large river, the James River, to the Petersburg area, and that's when officially the campaign was considered over and the siege of Petersburg began. Um, but during the course of that six weeks, the Union took about 55,000 casualties in those battles, and the South took about 30 to 35,000. It was horrific fighting. Grant just wouldn't let go. And um, this is a portion of the wilderness battlefield. And off to the left here, a little out of the picture, off over here is where the 7th Wisconsin was. And that's what it looked like, what they were fighting through. They couldn't see much of anything. They couldn't maintain their lines. They couldn't have artillery support. Um, conditions were awful, and park rangers say this is what it looked like 160 years ago. Um, it, it was just dense. And so from a soldier's standpoint, it was, it was not good. And technically, the Union lost the battle, but again, Grant wouldn't give up, so he just moved down by the left flank to Spotsylvania, and then on to North Anna, and then on to Cold Harbor, and they fought continuously almost for six weeks. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of the campaigns, uh, but they would continue to fight at Petersburg. 
Petersburg was a siege that lasted from mid-June 1864 to the 2nd of April 1865. And that's when the World War I type fighting occurred because both sides realized the importance of entrenching and it was a precursor to World War I. Um, and the Union tried to keep stretching out the southern lines because Grant knew he had more, money, more men than the South and so it took a while, but he stretched out the lines until he came to a place called Five Forks. And um, battle there on April 1st, um, General George Pickett, uh, Pickett's charge fame, was Confederate commander, and his division was reinforced by a cavalry division, a couple more brigades. General Sheridan, the Union commander, had a cavalry corps under him that he kind of pinned down the Confederates while the 5th Corps, containing the 7th Wisconsin, hit them on the flank and, and completely, pretty much destroyed Pickett's division. But of interest, there was a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Holland Richardson, who was now the head of the 7th Wisconsin. And during the battle, is the Corps commander, General Warren, was ordering the 7th Wisconsin and other troops into battle. Alan Richardson saw a Confederate soldier taking aim at the general, and he pushed the general out of the way and took the bullet himself. Fortunately, he did survive the war, but he did save the Corps commander's life. There's no question about that. And also, he, it's an interesting story. Alan Richardson was from Chippewa Falls, and initially in the war, he was a, a lieutenant in one of the companies in the 7th Wisconsin. And the commander of the regiment, a guy named William Robinson, when, when the regiment moved from Madison to Washington, D.C. area, he brought his family with him to live in Washington. Well, he had an attractive young daughter that Holland Richardson happened to meet, and they fell in love. And they wanted to get married. But Colonel, Colonel Robinson said, no, not just no, hell no. <laughs> because he didn't want his daughter to become a widow. Well, they did what a lot of young couples do. They eloped. <laughs> and so um, the good colonel was really pissed. <laughs> and he didn't even talk to the lieutenant for months. But eventually, Holland Richardson proved himself to be a good husband and a good leader because he rose through the ranks so he eventually commanded the regiment. And um, anyhow, I thought that was kind of a fun story. <laughs> also, talking about the Battlefield Trust that I mentioned earlier, in the 1980s, a Five Forks was a one-acre park maintained by the National Park Service, thanks to the American Battlefield Trust. Today, it's a 400-acre park with eight miles of, of uh, hiking trails. And that's typical of what the American Battlefield Trust has done. Another example is at Gettysburg. You may have seen pictures of General Lee's headquarters um, on Seminary Ridge. Um, and for, for decades, that was privately owned. And the owners had put up a very tacky looking hotel right next to the headquarters building. And so the American Battlefield Trust bought that land, tore down the hotel, and have replanted the orchard that existed there at the time of the battle, and it's a much more attractive place today. Um, but that's just another example of the type of things that they have done. So after Battle of Five Forks, the very next day, General Grant recognized that the southern troops were, they were spread out, and he ordered an attack all along the 40-mile line of the siege. That's how long the siege lines were around Petersburg, 40 miles. And the Sixth Corps broke through and forced General Lee and the Southern soldiers to retreat from, Pettis from Petersburg, as well as to abandon uh, Richmond. And it's the course of the campaign followed the Appomattox River from Petersburg toward what we know today as Appomattox Courthouse. And Interestingly, on the evening of April 8th, the, the Southern troops were being pressured hard by General Meade and the Army of the Potomac in their rear. But they really felt, they knew they had Union cavalry in front of them, 
Um, but infantry always could push cavalry aside. And the next morning, April 9th, the Confederates attacked the, U the Union cavalry at Appomattox Courthouse and did break through. Now they think they have the road open to uh, Lynchburg, um, Virginia. Well, when they got to this ridge, this beautiful spot, they looked out over this valley and not didn't see an open road, but what they saw were two Union Corps in line of battle, flags flying. And that's when General Lee, Lee knew the war was over. Those soldiers, including the 7th Wisconsin, had marched over 30 miles during the night to get in position to cut off the Confederate Army and end the war. And so, General Grant and General Lee meet in, met in this house with Wilmer McLean in Appomattox, and that's where they surrendered. And the formal surrender happened three days later. And many of you probably heard of Joshua Chamberlain from the movie Gettysburg or the book The Killer Angels. And he was designated by Grant to take care of the formal surrender. And so Union soldiers lined both sides of the road leading into the Appomattox Courthouse and the Confederate soldiers marched between them to stack their arms in, in sign of surrender. And when that happened, um, General Chamberlain ordered carry arms, which was a soldier's salute, to honor the Southern soldiers. Grant himself would not allow celebrations to occur on the Army of the Potomac when Lee surrendered because he did not want to dishonor those Southern soldiers. Unfortunately, that wasn't the end. Um, the last major battle of the war is considered a place called Fort Blakely, which, to be honest, I hadn't heard of until I saw a Stoughton soldier who died there. And that occurred on the same day that Lee surrendered to Grant. So I found that to be particularly sad, because effectively the war ended when, when Lee surrendered. But there was a battle down near Mobile, Alabama, uh, where the Union troops attacked this fort because they wanted to capture and close off Mobile. And a Stoughton soldier died there. And I, I just, you know, think it's so, it's, it's sad. Now, technically, General Johnson and the Southern Army in North Carolina surrendered two weeks later. But um, for all practical purposes, when, when Lee surrendered, everyone knew the war was pretty much over. And finally, that's a picture of Stoughton, just after the war. And, and the cost of Stoughton was significant. So that's what I found. That's what I wanted to share. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Yo, over here. Uh, you had said earlier the, the 459 was percent of the population. That population includes women and children and the age. Oh, yes. What percent of eligible <coughs> men would that have been? You know, I, I, that I don't know, but obviously a significant portion. Um, there was a draft, and that went into effect in 1863 after two years of the war. But I only found that I believe was three or four Stoughton soldiers were drafted. They were mostly volunteers. Now, certainly there would have been some pressure to, to join when the draft occurred. Um, but there were uh, very few draftees. In fact, that's one of the interesting things. So what, what motivated these men to volunteer, especially once the fighting it became recognized the fighting was going to be severe. You really have to admire. They, they fought for union. That was the primary motivation. Um, the time the war began, it was not about ending slavery. It was about preserving the union. And they fought, they felt that was worth their lives. participation in the Union Army of any subculture in the United States? 
You know, I don't know. I did. I do know that 6,500 Union soldiers were born in Norway. Over half of that number were from the state of Wisconsin. Um, I also know that there were of that 6,500, over a thousand of them were named Oli. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I understand the 15th often did speak Norwegian. Um, in fact, it, it's interesting, a lot of Norwegians did volunteer. Um, some other uh, cultures, no. They came to the US, they did not want to fight. And so it was certainly not universal that everybody wanted to fight. Um, 300 Norwegians also felt, fought for the Confederacy. Oh, yes. Franklin, Tennessee, the Battle of Franklin, is one of those sites that the American Battlefield Trust is working hard to preserve. Much of the battlefield has been built over in the suburbia, um, but a few years ago they spent quite a bit of money and bought, I think it was a pizza hut, and tore it down and restored it to what it looked like in 1864, uh, because that was a site of one of, I believe it was 10 Confederate generals were killed or wounded during that battle, and that was a site of one of the more famous Confederate generals where he was killed. Um, Okay, well, thank you very much. Wait, wait, one more question. Oh, one more question. Oh, yeah. Is it possible to access your list of um, Norwegians who served in the Stoughton area? Um, I have the list of Stoughton area soldiers. I don't know for sure which ones were Norwegian or not, but I'm happy to share my database. Um, the Vesterheim also maintains the database. And I know, for example, maybe, and this may be next winter's project, at least one Dunker area soldier from the, so from this area enlisted in a Minnesota regiment. So it was a Stoughton area soldier, but did not serve in a Wisconsin regiment. So I didn't find him in my database. Yeah. Speaking of water, I think at Vicksburg there was a lot of malaria down by the river. That certainly was, yes. So when the Wisconsin soldiers, I, I think I relative was in the 23rd Wisconsin Volunteer Infantry, and you can look up a lot of these guys, you know, regimental histories that are amazing. You should really look it up. But to get away from the malaria, they went to Little Rock, Arkansas, and Jordan. This is important for you. They saw a lot of good-looking women, and they decided not to marry any of them because they all shoot tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a problem with that? It's like being near Illinois. <laughs> uh, they, they went down, I think they were at the last battle of the Spanish Fort, which is, the Confederates saw them around Mobile, I guess, and just left. They didn't have a battle. But they took those soldiers and sent them down to Brownsville, Texas. And they said that on the way there, when they got there, they, they, they got a place called like Mono State Deal. It had, a, it had a Spanish name, but it was an island. That ends up that was uh, South Padre Island now. I took my kids down to see the Alamo some years ago. And uh, we went down there, it was a big vacation spot. But the Union Army was there. And not only did they have bad water in Vicksburg, but they had even worse water. They had some type of desalination machine. They went over to Brownsville and they took water out of the Mississippi or out of the, the Rio Grande. And they let it sit overnight and all the silt went out and the sure. coffee. And they said it was the sweetest water that they ever had. Wow. wow. And the reason they got sent down there was because Napoleon the third right. was getting around there and wanting to yes. go over Mexico. So the Wisconsin soldiers from the Wisconsin way through the country prevented 
Mexico for speaking French. <laughs> Thank you very much.